Hello, gals. Welcome. So we're going to move on. We are, let's see here, this is week 12. So two more lessons after this one. Um, I actually was thinking maybe I would go ahead and teach a few of the things in the back that were the extra teachings. So we'll see how that goes since it looks like we are going to be staying at home for a bit longer. And that's okay. We can continue to take advantage of this time. A friend of mine, we were talking on the phone yesterday, and she said that she asked the Lord, Lord, what's going on right now? What do you want me to do? And what came up in her was seize the day. Carpe diem, seize the day, seize every moment. Um, <clears throat> what I'm really hearing right now from the body of Christ is that the Lord has a, a plan during this time for us individually, for our churches, and for our nation. And we want to not miss that plan because we're just wanting things to get back to normal. We want to press into his heart. We want to grow in love with him more. We want to be praying the prayers that he wants to pray for the things he wants prayed. So I just want to encourage you all, seize the day. Um, take advantage of this time, really. And if you haven't so far and you're like, oh, I've wasted the last month just trying to keep myself busy, trying to keep myself distracted, I would encourage you, start now. Just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what do you want my life to look like at this time? And walk that out. So we're going to jump into the study here. Um, I'm going to open in prayer, and then we're going to start on page 104. 104, um, we actually covered a little bit of this, so just a real short review. So we're going to do that. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for your kindness and your mercy and your love. Thank you for the snow that's covered everything white and beautiful. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your kindness upon our life. Holy Spirit, we welcome you now into this time. Touch our hearts, touch our minds, touch our emotions, pull our will to the will of the Father. Touch us with truth, with life, Fill our eyes with the truth of the word. We hunger for you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to cover a couple verses that we ended on just as a review. On page 104, we're on chapter 5, verse 6. And if you remember, the maiden is in bed and she's having a dream is the feeling that we get. And we went over this, that this dream actually resembles a little bit of what she went through when she was in bed in, verse, or in chapter 2. Remember, she was in bed in chapter 2. The bridegroom comes. He stands behind the wall. He beckons her to go up the mountain with him. She doesn't want to. He gives her all the reasons that she could, should, she doesn't want to. He affirms her and tells her how wonderful she is. He, she doesn't want to. He tells her, okay, take care of those foxes that are keeping you from my will. She doesn't want to. Then um, he tells her, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Talk to me. Pray. Worship. Lift your face to me. She doesn't get out of bed. And actually, if you remember, she tells him, go on the mount, go up the mountain without me. I don't want to go. And as soon as he's gone, she grieves the loss. She grieves that her dis, uh, disobedience has actually caused the, the, her knowing his presence. Now, the Lord never leaves us or forsakes us, but we can lose that, that sensitivity to his presence through our lack of disobedience. And that's what she experiences. She gets up out of bed. She goes to the city seeking her beloved. She meets 
the um, <clears throat> church elders, she asks them, have you seen the one I love? They can't help her. She passes by them and he has come down the mountain and she encounters him. She grabs a hold of him and will not let, let him go. And this is a major step in maturity in her life. She's realizing that her disobedience, that her saying no to him has brought a loss to her life. And although from the time he came and beckoned her, asked her to come up the mountain, it took a chapter, literally a chapter for her to get out of bed and a lot of encouragement by him to do that. But she did get out of bed, she did follow him, and she proclaims that she's willing to go up the mountain. So now we're in a scene here where she's in bed again. And it says that she she sleeps, but her heart is awakened. She she in her dream, she senses him again, just like before she said that she could hear his voice as he came across the mountains. Here she senses his voice, hears his voice. He wants her to open up. We're not sure why she delays a little bit, um, but she does a tiny bit. Now, it's only a couple verses this time instead of a whole chapter. And um, verse 6 says, chapter 5, verse 6 on 104, I opened for my beloved. So she gets up and she opens the door. But my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up. When he spoke, I sought him, but I could not find him. I called to him, but he gave no answer. Why this is, we don't really know. Um, is it a dream that's kind of replaying a similar scenario? We talked about how lots of times in dreams, in natural dreams, we are actually replaying things that we're concerned about or that have bothered us. Why she's having this, we don't know. Um, was it because she didn't want to put on her robe? She didn't want to get her feet dirty. She really didn't want to get out of bed. Or some people feel like she wasn't in compromise at all. And this is actually the Lord kind of wooing and pulling her deeper into him. Whatever reason it is, we know this. She's made a good choice. She is not offended. She wants to seek him. She wants to pursue him. She wants to go after him. That is the right choice every time. No matter what's going on in our world right now, no matter the disappointments, no matter the discouragements, no matter the things that don't seem right, we want to pursue him first and most. We don't want to be offended. We don't want to allow offense in. We want to pursue him. Verse 7, at the bottom of 104, it says that she met up with a watchman. This is what happened before, remember? She met up with a watchman, and she asked them, Where is my beloved? Can you help me find him? And they didn't react. They didn't really help her. Actually, she needed to go past them to find him. Well, this time again, she finds the watchman. She comes along them. It says, She went about the city. The watchman went about the city, and they found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took my veil away from me. She starts to talk about these people that if you remember, she's had this conversation with the Lord before. And he said, he keeps telling her, go be connected to the body. Submit to authority. Now, of course, we would never say we want to put ourselves somewhere where we're being abused or hurt over and over. But we also need to understand that the watchmen, the leaders of our churches, of ministries, are men and women that are flawed and imperfect. And they will hurt and they will wound. So, so what's going on here? Is she being ignored? Is she being not validated like she'd like to be? Misunderstood? Underappreciated? Yes, all those things. They didn't say hi to her. They didn't acknowledge her giftings to the point that they actually took her veil away. Her veil was her ministry, her calling. That was taken away. 
Isn't it interesting right now, actually, a lot of people's ministries and callings have been, because of this virus, they're not able to walk out in the things that they're called to do. But the Lord always makes a way for us to still press in and minister if we will open ourselves up. Uh, it, it reminds me of when um, we were at Res for many, many years, and then we went to a little church in Greeley for about eight years. That was about eight years ago. And so 16 years ago, we went to this church in Greeley. We were there for about eight years serving. The Lord had our family there. It was God's will for us to be there for sure. And then we felt called back to Res. And when we came back to Res, things had changed in that eight years in the women's ministry. And the women's ministry had been before where we each had our own classroom. We had about 20, maybe 25 gals in our classrooms. And we taught on whatever the Lord had put on our heart to teach. It may be a book. It may be just a lesson that we were doing ourselves. And I loved it. It was one of the hardest things that I actually gave up when we moved to this little church in Greeley. I got to teach the youth there. I got to do a young um, girls group there. But it wasn't the same as when I got to teach ladies Bible study, study. I loved it. When we came back, they had made it where no longer were we really teachers, but we were now um, table facilitators. We were doing the study through a video, through a workbook, and we were facilitating tables. Well, I was about back about two years. I had been asked to facilitate a table. Honestly, I had never really done that before. I had only taught and had my class interaction, but never really facilitated somebody else's teaching. And I had said yes and went through the process of learning to do that. I had a great coach, <clears throat> which was awesome, but it was a time where I wasn't, my veil had been taken away. I wasn't functioning in my greatest calling, my greatest joy. And did I do it with my whole heart? Absolutely. And I loved it. But I also loved the day when I was able to start teaching my class again. And so sometimes it's not really even because someone's mad at us or something we've done wrong or they're just being mean. Sometimes our regular flow of ministry just ends for reasons that have nothing to do with us. And those are times we need to not be offended. We need to not be discouraged. We need to not be like, well, if it's not going to be the way I want it to be, then I'm not participating. <clears throat> that is not an mature response. It's an immature response. And we'll notice that we're in chapter 5, going into chapter 6 on this study. She's gaining maturity with each chapter that goes by. Her reactions are actions of a mature person instead of somebody that just wants their way. <clears throat> it's a beautiful thing. You can tell it's early in the morning. It's 8 o'clock on Friday morning right now. My throat has not gotten warmed up yet, but that's okay. Um, page 105 at the bottom, I just want to encourage you, if you did not read the extra readings at the bottom of 105, I would really encourage you to do that. <clears throat> Let's flip over to 106. And so we're going to see what her response is. She's been wounded. She's discouraged. She can't feel her beloved like she could before. She's going. She's seeking him. She's looking for him. Verse 8 at the top of 106. The Shulamite, she comes across the daughters of Jerusalem. These are her friends. These are the people that she's been actually mentoring and helping along the way. So no matter why she's in this situation, if it was from her own choice, if it was from the choice of others, if it was the Lord just drawing her deeper to him, she has an opportunity to grow here. And she is seizing this opportunity to grow. No matter what's going on in our lives right now, 
with the virus going on in the world. This is something we've never experienced before. We have different emotions. We have different opportunities. We are limited so much more than we ever have been. Let us seize this opportunity to grow and mature and draw closer to the King, draw closer to our beloved. Do not waste this time, gals. So she says to the, the daughter, she says, I charge you. This is very important to her. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am lovesick. I long for him. I want him. I long to grow closer to him. I long to be with him. Not only is she making this decision in her own heart, she is allowing those around her that sees her wounds, that see her disappointment, that sees her discouragement, she's allowing them to hear, I am lovesick. I am not offended. I love him. I, I don't have to figure out what's going on. We don't have to figure out what's going on, gals. But don't miss the opportunity to grow deeper in love with him. We don't know the world, the flesh, the devil. We don't know everything that's happening, things that are bombarding our mind. But we do know this, the Lord has a plan in this season. He has a plan for our world. He has a plan for our nation, for our churches. He has a plan for our families. And he has a plan for us individually. Seize the moment. Grab a hold of it. Don't let this moment pass you by. I am lovesick. She refuses to be offended. Now, before we go on to the next part of the study, I just want to share something that the Lord's been stirring in my heart this last week. I've actually gotten three opportunities to share this with people through Zoom. Um, <clears throat> I'm part of a Wednesday morning group. And we were talking on a different subject than what I'm going to share. And one of the gals said, tell us what the Lord's talking to you about, Carrie. And so I did. Actually, I've gotten to share this four times now. I did. Um, later on that day, I was on a Marco Polo chat with somebody. It's a video chat with a group of gals that are part of the prayer ministry. And one of them said, talk to us about what the Lord's talking to you about right now. So I did. Later on, I had a phone call. Uh, actually, that evening, we were having our all um, church, all the campuses have been meeting through a Zoom call on Wednesday nights to have a prayer gathering. And <clears throat> Hannah Garcia, who had been part of the chat earlier on that day, said, Carrie, would you share with us what you shared earlier? That was on Wednesday. Yesterday, I had a phone call with a dear friend that I hadn't talked to since this all began. And she said, tell me what the Lord's talking about. So I've gotten many times to rehearse this. And I just want to share with you all just briefly because it ties into this so much. This whole thing of tell him I'm long sick, love sick. Tell him I long for him. I want you all just to stop. Lord, I'm love sick. Just Pay attention to what that does, like in your heart, the grip. Lord, I long for more of you. The word that we put with that, a word that comes to my mind is spiritual hunger. Longing for him shows us our spiritual hunger. This is something the Lord started to talk to me about a couple weeks ago. And since then, isn't it fun how the Lord does this? He's brought it up in a variety of people I've heard talking about this time. One of them's Mike Bickle, my favorite person ever. And he was just sharing about how so many of us have been saying, well, if I had more time, I would spend more time in the Word. If I had more time, I'd love to spend more time in prayer. If I had more time, I'd join more prayer meetings, um, to focus on more Bible studies, go deeper in the Word, talk to God more. Well, we have the time. We have no excuse. We don't have any major distractions. Yes, we can come up with them, but they're not real. And how much are we pushing into his heart to see his face clearer, to fall in love with him more? How much are we? Maybe you are, and if you are, yay. 
Maybe you're not. And if you're not, let's stir up our spiritual hunger. Because what this actually, this time does is it actually reveals the truth. And we want to know the truth. We don't want to be deceived. We don't want to walk around making ourselves think we're super spiritual when really we lack that fervency for, for the Lord, for his face, for relationship with him. We want to know that if that exists. Search my heart, oh God. Show me anything that's hidden within. We want to to know the truth. Because if we know the truth, if we really see how spiritually lacking we are in the area of hunger for him, then we can go to him and we can talk to him about it. We can make the corrections. So just to let you know some journaling that I did, um, Psalms 32 one says, how happy and fulfilled are those whose rebellion has been forgiven and whose sins are covered by the blood. How happy and fulfilled are those? I read that the other day. I've been reading through the Passion Translation of the Psalms because I've never read it in that translation. And I came to that and I thought, how happy and fulfilled am I just by the fact that I'm forgiven? How much joy do I have in my heart just by that fact alone that I know him, that I'm his daughter, that I'm his favorite one, that I'm favored by him. And I have to be real with myself. I'm happier with breakthrough. I'm happier with answered prayers. I'm happier with, with um, <clears throat> seeing, you know, things come through that I've been praying for and wanting than just to sit at his feet. And it's good to come to that point where we know, okay, Lord, I need to go to you. I need you to touch my heart more. Do I love him? Yes, I love him. But I want to love him more. I want him to be my first and my most. I want him to be my one thing. I want to truly be lovesick for his presence when I'm going through my day and I haven't connected with him yet. I want to grieve over the moments we're apart. I want to be lovesick for him more than ever. So I went on in this vein, looked up a few verses. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. Again, when we hunger and thirst, we're satisfied. The Lord touches our heart like no one else. He brings joy and fulfillment as we dwell in the truth of what he has accomplished for us. Spiritual hunger is also accompanied with great satisfaction and fulfillment. He is the only one that can truly satisfy the longing of our heart. Mike Bickle uses this term, it's, holy dissatisfaction. So I am satisfied in the fact that Jesus loves me, that I'm his, but I am dissatisfied in the, in the level I'm at, I want more. So there's this holy dissatisfaction. There's this, I am satisfied in you and you alone. Therefore, I need more of you and you alone. I hope that makes sense. So I went on in my journal. I'm just sharing my journal with you right now from a couple days ago. I want greater hunger. I want to cry over the word and I want to cry over his heart for me. Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. This is, this is um, David. He's making a declaration Come on, soul, seek after him. Seek after him earnestly. Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Pay attention to that phrase. 
He's in a dry and weary land where there's no water. And this is what I wrote. There's no answer in our world for what we're longing for. That feeling that you have within, that going about the city searching for him, encountering our friends and saying, if you see him, if you see my beloved, tell him I'm lovesick. That, that longing in our heart for more, it's not answered by this world. For the world only has distractions, only empty works, and only temporary satisfaction. We can distract ourselves right now with de-junking our houses, deep cleaning them, watching TV shows, or even listening to Christian podcasts, which I've been doing a lot of and I love it. But I don't want that to be a distraction. I want that to be an addition to what the Lord is talking to me about. After the Lord started to talk to me about this, I looked up past teachings by people like Mike Bickle, whom I honor and respect, on spiritual hunger. It was what the Lord was talking to me about. So I wanted to plug into somebody else's wisdom on that. But I don't want that to replace my time sitting before his feet, gazing at who he is, listening, reading his word and listening to his voice. What do you say to me about these words, Lord? Only you can satisfy. Earnestly, I want to seek him. I want to thirst for him. I don't want to substitute him with distractions during this time. I want him to be my first and my foremost. I want my heart to long for him. I want his move, his heart to move my heart in prayer. I want his heart to move my heart in worship. Um, one of our members of our class, Melissa, she shared this during another Zoom call for our life group that she's a part of. We were sharing about worship songs and what worship songs move your heart and how do you worship while you're at home. And she shared some songs that move her heart and, and um, she, like others, shared about how she'll, the, her posture during worship and some, something that she shared I just thought was precious is she says, sometimes I'll just ask the Lord, what song do you want to hear? And that was a whole new thing to me. I love the worship songs that I love because they touch my heart, yes. But how much of it is, Lord, what do you want me to pray? What verse do you want me to declare? What song do you want to hear me sing? I want to, I want to long for him. I want to be more in love with him than ever before. And I just encourage you during this time, press into his heart. All right, let's get going on our new part of the lesson, 107. So something that I want you to notice is her response to her opening the door. He's not there. She goes about the elders wound her. Her response is, I'm lovesick. The main's response to God, she responds to God with love and she walks in humility by asking for help from others. She asks the daughters, if you see him, if you know the answer, tell me, I'm open. She chooses love and trust towards the Lord instead of being disappointed and discouraged. We don't want to take on the mindset. Well, you guys just don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what it's like. It's different than other people's issues, problems, situations. Maybe your stay at home is rough and it's hard. But I know this, we can trust the Lord no matter what our situation is. We can trust him. So choose not to question God, but trust him. We want to press into him more. We want to grab a hold of his heart. So let's see what happens. <clears throat> Song of Solomon 5, 8 through 9. This is the Shulamite. I'm going to read that and then continue on because before um, 
I read just eight. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, <clears throat> if you find my beloved, that you tell him I'm lovesick. The daughters of Jerusalem respond in verse 9. What is your beloved more than other beloveds, O fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? Literally what they're saying is here. Now, wait a minute. You've been hurt. You don't know where he is. You can't find him. You can't feel his presence like you have before. His workers, his watchmen, the people in the church, they've wounded you. They've hurt you. We don't get it. What's so great about him that you would be going through this turmoil, going through this hurt, and you still want to be with him? Why? What's so great about him? You've been wounded. You've been disappointed. And this is how you react? We can walk through things in our life and we can feel the sting of disappointment. And it doesn't have to take us down. We actually can shine brighter than before with his love, with his kindness, I remember um, one time it was on a evening service at Res, and there was a group that went forward for a call. I was in there. I don't remember what the call was. I was talking to the Lord about my heart. And this was during the period where I was coming out of just that real traumatic experience, just very lots of grief, lots of heartache, lots of loss during that two-year period. And we were coming out of that period in time and I had been pressing into the Lord. I had been seeking his face. I had been pressing in and refusing to be offended even when I felt offense coming up. Refusing to question his goodness even when I felt like questioning it. And I remember being up front talking to him and just saying, Lord, what do you want to say to me right now? And I remember these words. He says, you don't have to be sad anymore. And I remember just thinking, I don't know exactly how not to be, but I will agree with you. I will not be sad. I will not be discouraged. I will not be disappointed. And I just see this maiden at this moment where things are not the way they should be. They're not the way she had planned. And she says, I'm lovesick, I must find my beloved. And the people around her are going, that doesn't make sense. I don't understand. What's so great about him that you would push through this pain and seek him? We want people around us not just so they'll look at us and go, wow, you're cool, you're awesome, you're super spiritual, but that they'll actually be pointed to him. That's what's happening here. These women aren't going, how do you do this? You're amazing. What they're saying is, tell us about him. What's so great about him? Why do you love him more than anything else? It's beautiful, gals. This is a beautiful thing to provoke in others around us. It's a beautiful thing to stir up within ourselves. <clears throat> so in their spiritual immaturity, the daughters asked the maiden the question. She, they asked these questions throughout Song of Solomon. Here they do not understand why she is lovesick for the bridegroom in the middle of her distress. Why do you... They do not understand why she is not offended or disheartened. They want to know why she's so loyal to him. And what does she know about him that they don't know? We should be provoking people to want to know Jesus more, the way we know him. And they say this, it's interesting. They say, what is your beloved more than another beloved? So they start to talk about these other beloveds. There's things in people's lives 
that actually become more important than the bridegroom. There's things in our lives that become more important than the bridegroom. Our family's happiness is not more important than the bridegroom. Our happiness is not more important than the bridegroom. This brings me back to the very first couple of verses in Song of Solomon. Remember, she makes this declaration, your love is better than wine. Your love is better than anything else. She made that declaration and now she's getting to walk it out. We too should be declaring things that when things come up that isn't as planned and isn't as fun as it should be, that we can make these declarations. Our heart is held strong because in the normal times, we're declaring his goodness, his kindness, his faithfulness. And then when in the unnormal times come, we're declaring his goodness, his kindness, and his faithfulness. We must intentionally keep things in their correct places in our lives. We can do this by doing what the maiden does in these next few verses. She focuses on and declares the beauty of the bridegroom. We've talked about this the whole time, ladies. It is key to your life that every day, all day long, things are coming out of your mouth declaring his goodness. You're good. You're faithful. Something that I had written but I haven't dived into yet in my journal when I was talking about spiritual hunger, and this is kind of the next place I feel like the Lord is laying on my heart to go. I said, I believe spiritual hunger and deep gratitude of the heart go hand in hand. I want to be thankful for him. I want to be thankful for him. Yes, for all of his blessings. Yes, for what he's doing in my life right now. But more than anything, him. I want to be thankful for his goodness, his kindness. We must stay focused on the goodness of the Lord. Therefore, we will respond right in disappointment. Let's go on to verse 10 and see what she says. She starts this whole list of, of how she sees him. Now, remember, she's responding to the question, what's so great about him? Why is he so much better than anything else? Why are you responding, not in fear, or not in anger, or not in disappointment? Why? Tell us why. And so she does, and she takes her time doing it. Um, she starts out by, she says, My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among ten thousands. White, he's radiant, he's fascinating, he is not like us. He's amazing. I mean, we can just go on and on about how amazing he is. He's rooty. He's red. It means humanity. He is like me. Remember? White, radiant, fascinating. He's not like us. He's red. He's rooty. He's humanity. He's like me. He understands my humanity. He doesn't look at me and say, oh, come on, Carrie, get this together. He cheers me on. You can do it. Press into me. He understands my weakness and he loves me despite it. He is chief. He is superior. He is above all. The maiden starts with an overwhelming statement of the king's beauty. Then she goes on to establish 10 attributes and finishes with a summary statement in verse 16. So we're going to look at those. Now, as I read through the verse at the top of page 108, I am actually going to start explaining what they mean as we go. She starts and she says, his head is like the finest gold. The Lord's leadership his head always depict, uh, depicts leadership. His leadership is over all creation. He's divine in nature. That's the gold. And it's the fineness. It's of high degree, quality of excellence. In other words, she starts by saying his leadership is perfect. He leads well. 
This is why we don't ever question God's leadership. We can go to him and say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on in this situation. If there's something I need to do different, if there's something I need to learn, show me what I need to learn. Is there something I need to take authority over the enemy? Show me how to take authority over the enemy. And then, Lord, I trust you. I trust your leadership is good. I trust you are leading well. Christina had a, a call yesterday with one of her bosses back at IHOP. They're having to do some restructuring. And uh, she had been part of the decision-making process on this. And they had decided that they really wanted her actually working with students more. She's very gifted in that. She's super gifted with discipling and encouraging. And they wanted her working one-on-one -on -one with students more. And they put her on this amazing team. It literally is her dream job. It's what she's wanted and longed for. But in doing that, they had to take her old job and they had to subdivide and decide on the money. And the pay is lower now for her. She was already making very, very low pay because at IHOP, since it's a mission base, they uh, want you to raise support, but then they also are one of your supporters. It's not really a paycheck because it's not even minimum wage, but it's that they become one of your supporters. And with each position and each level of responsibility, um, there's an amount of support that they give. So <clears throat> she gets off this meeting. She's super excited about the job. Like I said, she was part of the decision making, what her new job was gonna look like. They love her there, they treasure her there. <clears throat> but came this significant pay cut. And so there's mixed emotions. And she sat on the couch and I sat there and we have mixed emotions. And, and I said, you know what? I really believe when you went in to have this conversation, we knew it was around this. We knew the possibility of the pay change. I asked the Lord what he was saying. And he said, what is happening in this meeting right now is exactly what I want. And you can trust me. Because of course... I want my daughter provided for. And she has people that support her. She doesn't have a lot of supporters, but she does have some supporters that support her amazingly. People have always been awesome about giving to her for ministry trips when she went to Paraguay for six weeks just this last summer. She had almost all of that supplied for by people giving her the money. So people have blessed her and, um, and, they will continue to. We're believing for more supporters for her to make up this difference. But it was at that moment when we have to stop those things like that that don't seem what we wanted and don't seem actually completely right. But she knows she's where she's supposed to be. She refuses offense of the heart. where She refuses to blame, to point her finger, and to say, gosh, I wish something was different. And she had to work through this. This wasn't like, bam. But she had to work through this, sitting on the couch, talking to me. Spe we're speaking the truth. We're encouraging one another to choose his leadership is good. He can be trusted. He leads well. She knows she's on the team she's supposed to be on. She knows she's doing the job she's supposed to be doing. She knows she's supposed to be at IHOP serving the way she's serving. So she trusts him to make up the difference financially. God is faithful. His leadership is good. We don't have to figure everything out. We just have to know, am I following his voice? Am I taking care of my heart where I refuse to be offended? And do I trust him to make up all the difference and to set things the way they're supposed to be? His leadership is perfect. Now, that doesn't mean that we just go, okay, what will be will be and it's God's will. 
No, there's still our part that we play. We stop, we listen to the voice of the Lord, we obey what he says, we take authority over the enemy when he's trying to still kill or destroy in our life. Remember John 10:10, 10, 10, the enemy comes to still kill and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. So in the middle of the enemy's attack, God's leadership is there and it's good, but we have to put our face uh, uh, towards him. We have to set our eyes on him and believe he leads, guides, and directs perfectly. His leadership is good. It goes on and she says, his locks are wavy, speaking of his hair. The black uh, and black as raven. This speaks of God's dedication. The ha the hair speaks of dedication in the Word of God, and He is dedicated to us. His dedication is black or wavy. It speaks of of youthfulness, zeal, energetic. He's not He's not just sitting on the throne, going, "Yeah, I love you." He is intervening in our life when we ask him to intervene. He is moving in our life when we ask him to move. It is a beautiful thing. We can trust him. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of water. His eyes, the Lord's infinite knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and discernment is at work in our life, and they're like doves. Now, I didn't write down doves in the list, ladies, if you want to add that. They're devoted. He's devoted to me. His eyes are on me. Remember, he said to her, I think it was in chapter 2, you have dove's eyes. Might be chapter 1, you have dove's eyes. He was speaking truth into her. You are devoted to me even in your weakness. Now he says to us, I have dove's eyes for you. I am devoted for you. I love you. I have a plan for you. It is clear. I have singleness of vision in your life. I am devoted to you. It's beautiful. Next, it says, uh, let's see here. His eyes are like doves. Remember, she's telling him why she's so in love with him. She's telling the daughters, his eyes are like doves. They're on me by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. He has beautiful eyes. They're set upon me. Verse 13, his cheeks are like a bed of spices. His cheeks, his emotions. Do you remember when he was affirming her earlier on in the book? that he said her cheeks were beautiful, her emotions are made up. His cheeks are beautiful. He has affection for us. We need to be speaking out, Lord, you love me. So she's telling him, his eyes are on me. He's devoted to me. His affection is for me. He loves me. Can you imagine the daughters listening to her? Going, wow, I didn't know that. Wow, that's awesome. No way, that's so good. They are getting stirred in their hearts. His cheeks are like bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lily, lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His lips, his words, are like lilies. They're sweet and they're pure. Lilies mean purity. So it's what you say, what, what you say matters, Lord. His words matter in our life. He says we are more than conquerors. He says we can do all things through him who strengthens us. He says that we are the head and we are not the tail. We are above only and not beneath. He says we are his beloved. He says that we ravish his heart. He says he is devoted to us and that we are devoted to him. His lips are sweet and they drip with myrrh. They actually exhort us to die to ourselves and to live to, for him. He, ex he exhorts us. He cries out to us, take up your cross and follow me. You know what it means when we take up our cross? 
We get to follow him. We get to be with him. When we die to fear, we get to be with him in faith. When we die to discouragement, we get to be with him in courage and encouragement. When we die to self-pity, we get to walk exhorting others with him in exhortation, life, and liberty. We want to take his words. We want to die to ourselves, and we want to live to what he says. It's beautiful. Verse 14. His hands are rods of gold set in burl. His body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphire. She begins to explain what he looks like. His hands are his divine works and activities. They're rods of gold. They're divine. He works well. He moves on our behalf. His body is the Lord's tender compassion for us. It's carved with ivory. It's rare. We don't even understand the level of his compassion. We can't understand it by human compassion. The most compassionate, kind person you can know does not compare with the compassion of the Lord. He is compassionate to us. Verse 15, his legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as cedar. So his legs, his walk, his administration, the way he pursues us is like pillars. It's strength, it's orderliness, it's beauty. In other words, he's strong. He is strong enough to carry you. He is strong enough to lead you well. He is strong enough to lead you through the worst situation, through the worst crisis. He is strong enough. They are marble. They're strong. They're permanent. His countenance, that's how he appears. God's impartation to his people. He shines upon us and causes us to shine. We are the moon, he is the sun. He shines upon us and reflects his light to others. He is excellent as cedar. He is strong. Verse 16, his mouth is most sweet. His words, intimacy of knowing him, his mouth, kiss me with the truth of your word, Lord. His mouth is most sweet. And then she makes this declaration to sum it up. They've asked why he's so great. What's so great about him? Why do you love him? Why do you refuse offense? Why do you refuse disappointment? Why do you refuse discouragement? Why? This is why. He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. He is altogether lovely. Her summary statement is that her beloved is only beautiful, only good, only kind, only wonderful, excellent, and pure. And he's mine. He's altogether lovely and he is my beloved. He is my friend. The one the main loves is not only radiant in his majesty, but he has humbled himself to be our friend. He cares about what we care about. He pays attention to us personally. He is the best of friends. He is the best of friends. Mike Bickle writes, as we become familiar with these truths, we will be able to speak them to Jesus to express love. We speak them to the devil when he accuses us. He accuses God to us. When the devil comes and says, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about what's going on. We say, no, he's altogether lovely. He is my beloved. He is my friend. And we can also speak them to ourselves in times of temptation and discouragement. 
We can also speak them to others who need to be encouraged to trust and love Jesus. We speak them to remember. We talk to others of the goodness of the Lord to remind them. Be consumed with him, ladies. Become consumed with him. So they asked him what was so great. She takes her time to explain it in detail. Then she ends with a climax. She ends with a climax. He's all together lovely. He, everything about him is good. There is no flaw in him. Then they ask, and we go on to chapter 6. So at the bottom of 109, we go on to chapter 6. And the daughters respond to this by saying, Where has your beloved gone, O fairest among women? Where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him too? She has actually provoked others to love Jesus, to seek after him by her love for him and her fervency to seek after him. We affect people around us. The maidens answer the daughter's question, what is he? Um, in your notes, it says, where is he? It should actually say, what is he? The maidens have said, what, what is he? Why is he so great? And she's answered this and caused them to ask a new question. Where can we find him? Where is he? It's beautiful. It's so, so good. When we speak of the goodness and faithfulness of the Lord to others, it causes them to desire to seek him out and grow in love with him. The Passion Translation says, O oh, rarest of beauties, where has your lover gone? We long to see him too. Where may we find him? We will follow you as you seek after him. That reminds me of um, Alan Hood. He is a speaker out at IHOP, a very um, big part of it. And when he came to IHOP at the age of mid-20s, he noticed Mike Bickle praying on the mic. And he was praying and talking to the Lord and talking to the Lord about how good the Lord is. And he went up to Mike and he said, um, how do you, you pray like you personally know the Lord, like you know him. How do you pray like that? How, how can I pray like that? It reminds me that ending in the Passion Translation, we will follow you as you seek him. You're the example I want. Paul even said that, follow me as I follow the Lord. What, how do you do this? And, and Mike shared with him how he did it. He went through the Word of God, and as he read the Word, all he did for a season was look for God's characteristics, who God said he was. Or in a story, like the story of uh, the leper, how Jesus reached out and touched the leper. Jesus was showing compassion, so he would write compassionate. And he just looked for the characteristics of God. So Alan had said he went and did it. He took a season and he went through the whole Word of God looking for his characteristics, circling them, highlighting them, writing them in. And then he did it again. And I'll tell you what, there are prayers I have heard Alan Hood pray that I have written down because they have so moved my heart. He has such a connection with the Lord, such a love for the Lord. It's so beautiful. And I long and I'm like, oh, I want more of that. I have started doing that through the Word. The New Testament, I've gone through already, circled, highlighted. But when I read the Word, that's something I purposely look for. Who are you? Where are you? What are you like? I want to know you. Let's go to page 110. We're going to end with this today. Song of Solomon, 
6, 2 through 3. The Shulamite knows exactly where he's at. Isn't that interesting? She says, My beloved has gone to his garden, to the bed of spices, to feed his flock in the gardens, and to gather lilies. Verse 3, I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. I know where he's at because we're the best of friends. He's my beloved. I'm his beloved. He has gone to his garden. Jesus is in his church and is building it. I, I just find this so interesting. We're seeing over and over her being disappointed in the church and then being told to go to the church, being disappointed in the church. And then she's like, that's right where he's at is amongst like believers. The maiden teaches the daughters where they can find the bridegroom, his garden. His garden here is singular and it speaks of the church worldwide, which is made up of individual churches or the gardens, which is plural. It says he feeds his flock in the gardens. We want to be connecting with the body of Christ right now as much as we can so we can be fed. The beloved wants the maiden connected to the body, even though she has been hurt. The beds, the beds are plural and are within his one garden, the church. So you have the church worldwide, then you have these little beds. And what's cool about the beds of spices is they represent God's different graces manifested. And each ministry has a unique spice. Each bed of spice in the garden has a unique fragrance to Christ. We never want to judge one bed over the other. I believe that lots of times we're pulled to a certain spice of the church. And that's where the Lord has us mainly functioning in is that spice. But... It doesn't mean that's the only spice and that that spice is better than the others. It just means that that's the part of the body. That's the part that the Lord has you focusing on. Um, and that is where he feeds us. He feeds us in these different spices. There are different parts of the body that I plug into and I listen to their messages and I participate in their, and I give to them. And I, there's, there's three or four in the body of Christ that I'm connected with, but it doesn't mean there isn't so many more that's valid and good. And I'm seeing a lot of those right now during this time. And so she ends this conversation with them by clarifying, I am my beloved's and my beloved's is mine. He and I are companions and we belong together. We belong together. We belong with him in our personal time with him here in our homes. We belong together in ministry. We belong together in the, um, body worldwide, we belong together. Now is not the time, gals. I've said this before. I'm saying it again. Now is not the time to judge how others are responding. Now is not the time to judge people's hearts. You may he be hearing one ministry saying one thing, and you're like, ah, oh, that touches my heart. And you're hearing another ministry say something else, and you're like, I don't really get that, or I don't think that's really the important thing right now. Well, if the Lord's laid it on their heart, they're part of the body, they're that spice to deliver a certain message that will touch somebody else's heart. We are part of the body, but more than that, we're His. We are His beloved. We are His daughters. We are His friends. And thank you, Lord, for this time together. Help us, Lord, to lay down any offenses, any disappointments. Help us to press in in spiritual hunger, longing for you, that we connect with your body. We connect with what the body is doing right now in the world. But most of all, Lord, we long to see your face, to hear your voice, 
and to receive your touch. Holy Spirit, touch us like never before. Father, we declare right now we're lovesick. We hunger for you. Where our hunger has been lacking, we repent and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to place within us, to stir up within us a hunger for the word, a hunger for prayer, a hunger for worship, and more than anything, a hunger for the face of God. That we stop, that we make it a priority to set our eyes on him, to connect with the body during this time, yes, but more than anything, Lord, we want to connect with you. Touch our hearts. You are our beloved. You are our friend. You are our favorite one, and we are your favorite one. We love you. I bless every person that's listening to this right now. Holy Spirit, show them how to stir up the hunger within. Holy Spirit, empower us to be hungry. We love you, Jesus. We set our face on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, gals.